Dear friends, good morning and welcome to Worship with Westminster. Whether you are with us on the YouTube or here in these pews, whether this is your first time in this sanctuary or if this is the only church you've ever attended, you are very, very welcome and we are very glad that you are here to worship Christ with us today. I just want to take a point of privilege and thank God for the blessing of cooler weather. I'm not going to say fall is here, but whatever this is, I like it a lot. Uh, so, A few announcements as we begin. Choir is starting back. Very exciting. Our chancel choir's first Zoom rehearsal of this season takes place Thursday, September 30th. I believe that's this Thursday at 7.30 p.m. If you are interested in joining the choir for a mix of in-person and Zoom events and performances, you can contact our dear Minister of Music, Monica Rossman. All interested singers are welcome. And as folk musician Pete Seeger used to say, if you can talk, you can sing. So that's all of you. You're all welcome. You are all also welcome. We are having a holy circle this afternoon at 3 p.m. on the terrace outside the fellowship hall. This is an opportunity to connect with the Holy Spirit in community around the topic of racial equity. This is going to be a conversation and a time of prayer and consideration and reflection led by Linda Barnett and the Reverend Sherry Barton Henry. All are invited to that as well. Uh, stewardship season, the most wonderful time of the year, is right around the bend. Our kickoff Sunday is going to be October 10th, and our theme this year is Draw Near to God. This has been a season where a lot of us feel like we have been sort of scattered, and so we're going to think about what it means to reconnect in terms of stewardship. So get excited for that. There will be lots more information coming soon. I also wanted to go over some of our COVID protocol and just reinforce some of the things we have going on. Uh, in worship together, we are still not singing out loud. I would ask that you let our brave ensemble up here be our collective voice. And I also invite you to hum from your hymnal. You can call it a humnal, and you can read. <laughs> It's good. I'm sure I didn't come up with that. <laughs> uh, but you can read along with the lyrics, and that is certainly a way of praying as well. Uh, we need your help spreading the word. We now have overflow seating available in the fellowship hall. We live stream and project the live stream. Uh, it is a good way, if you don't want to be in a room with quite as many people, you can spread out, you can stand up. If you have young children, you can let them run around. And uh, so there is that offering too. Uh, if you would just help us spread the word to everybody that that is available, we want to make sure everybody knows about that. Also, because we're not passing the, uh, the collection plate right now, there is now an offering box for tithes and offerings that is in the narthex of the sanctuary, that little room right out before you get outside. So there won't be a basket anymore, but there's a little locked box, and so please use that if you would. Finally, I am pleased to announce that this morning we welcome the Reverend Mary Ann McKibben Dana to worship with us. She uses the pronouns she and her. She is a writer, a free-range pastor, a speaker, and a ministry coach living in the Virginia suburbs of Washington, D.C. She penned God, Improv, and the Art of Living about embracing improvisation as a spiritual and life practice. She also led a very popular uh, women's retreat a few years back, so some of y'all will definitely recognize her. I heard amazing things about that retreat. She also wrote a really cool-sounding book called Sabbath in the Suburbs. She speaks to groups about these and other topics. In addition to her books, her writing has appeared in Time.com, The Washington Post, Huffington Post, Religion, Dispatches, and a whole lot of other places. She was featured on PBS's Religion and Ethics News Weekly for her work on Sabbath and was recognized by the Presbyterian Writers Guild with the David Steele Distinguished Writer Award. I say all of this to emphasize what a delight and a blessing it is to be able to hear her preach to us this morning. So 
please welcome her. You'll see her out there. You can ask her all about uh, these amazing things. <sighs> it's Sunday morning. It is time to worship God. So let us turn our hearts and minds to the divine who loves us and who has brought us all here for a reason. Friends, the Lord be with you. Let us together worship God. Please stand and join me in the call to worship using the words found in your bulletin. We have arrived at this place to rest and be revived. In this holy place, angels ascend and descend. We have come scattered in hopes of being recollected and rejoined. We have come with the hope that all peoples will be blessed. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place.
Amen. Please be seated. Dear friends, why do we confess our sin? Because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But why do we do this together? Because we are a community, a covenant people. Then let us confess our sin. Everlasting God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have allowed sin to separate us from one another and from you. We have pursued power and prestige rather than humility and righteousness. Like Jacob, we have built legacies upon stolen blessings. We have justified our selfish desire and sacrificed relationships upon altars of individualism and accumulation. Merciful God, forgive us. Set us free to try again. Teach us to rest that we may be healed. Give us the strength to turn from our temptations and open our eyes to the angelic majesty of life lived in community. In the name of the Creator, the Christ, and the Comforter, we pray. Amen. Dear friends, hear the words of the gospel, the good news. News so good, it is the best news I know. In Christ, we are forgiven. Our sins are forgotten, and we are set free. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please be seated. But I would welcome any children who would like to come to the front uh, to do so at this time. I'm going to put my mask on so we can keep each other safe. Hey, how's it going? It might just be you and me today. That's okay. Oh, there's more coming. Oh, good. Okay. That'll be a little less intense for you. Yeah. 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 Ah, perfect. <laughs> I 
Hey, it's good to see all of you. I'm going to start talking, but don't be in any rush to sit down. Uh, and make yourself very comfortable. I have a story uh, from when, hello, I was around your age. Uh, I had to sit in the back seat of the car, usually in a car seat, and I couldn't stand it. And I kept looking forward with all of my heart and my mind and my strength to the day when I would be the driver. And then, you know, 14, 15 years later, I became the driver. I was the one driving the car, and it was very disappointing. <laughs> and I now drive literally every day, and... Uh, Spoiler alert, children, it's not as fun as it might appear. Um, why am I telling you this? Today, we're reading a Bible story about a man named Jacob who has a dream. And in the dream, there is a ladder that goes all the way up to heaven. And on that ladder, there are angels going up and there are angels going down. It's a detail in this story that we often forget there are angels going up, and there are angels coming down. Now, it makes sense that there are angels going up. We think about being called up to heaven all the time. But the fact that there are angels coming down is very important, and I'll tell you why. The fact that there are angels coming down on that ladder means that this earth is connected to heaven by a two-way road. There are beautiful, important things that happen in heaven, but those things sometimes come down here to earth, and those things are called blessings. And there are so many blessings right here, right where you are, right this minute. There are so many blessings to be had. It's very easy to, uh, oh, it's very easy to get caught up in getting excited about the next thing. But I assure you that there are blessings, there are good things for you to enjoy, even in the back seat of the car, even in your car seat. So, let's pray. Do, do any of you have anything to say before we finish? No? You're feeling good? Okay. All right. Let us pray then. Lord, we thank you for the blessings of this moment. We thank you for peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. We thank you for car seats. We even thank you for boredom. Amen. All right. Thank you. I think y'all are going to Godly Play. Is that right? Oh, that sounds really fun. Enjoy it. I'll see you soon. Yeah. For our prayer for illumination this fall, members of the choir or individual singers will sing our prayer and then the congregation will then recite the text as our prayer. That text is printed in the bulletin or can be found at number 455 in your hymn book. We hope this song becomes ever more meaningful to you in its repetition during this season. Listen to the word that God has spoken. Listen to the one who is close at hand. Listen to the voice that began creation. Listen even if you don't understand. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Genesis chapter 27, verses 1 through 4, and then 15 through 23. It's the story of Jacob, who, with the help of his mother, Rebecca, steals his father Isaac's blessing from his brother Esau. When Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called his elder son Esau and said to him, My son, and he answered, Here I am. He said, See, I am old. I do not know the day of my death. Now then, take your weapons, your quiver, and your bow, and go out to the field and hunt game for me. 
Then prepare for me savory food such as I like, and bring it to me to eat, so that I may bless you before I die. Then Rebekah took the best garments of her elder son Esau, which were with her in the house, and put them on her younger son Jacob. And she put the skins of the kids on his hands and on the smooth part of his neck. And then she handed the, the savory food and the bread that she had prepared to her son Jacob. So he went into his father and said, My father. And he said, Here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I'm Esau, your firstborn. I've done as you told me. Now sit up and eat of my game so that you may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, How is it that you found me so quickly, my son? He answered, Because the Lord your God granted me success. Then Isaac said to Jacob, Come near, that I may feel you, my son, to know whether you are really my son Esau or not. So Jacob went up to his father Isaac, who felt him and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are of the hands of Esau. He did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother's Esau's hand. So he blessed him. Jacob's stealing of Esau's blessing leaves him running for his life from fear of his brother's reprisal. Our story continues now in chapter 28, verses 10 through 17. Jacob left Beersheba and went towards Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed there for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. And he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on earth, the top of it reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your offspring. And your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth. And you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done as I have promised you. Then Jacob woke from his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Our second reading comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 50 and 51. And Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to Philip, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. It is such a gift to be here with you all this morning. As you heard from Alex and can read in my bio, I wear a lot of hats in ministry, and two of my favorite hats to wear are two that I have worn with this congregation. The first is, uh, as Alex mentioned, leading the women's retreat uh, in the before times, a wonderful time together at the beach. And the second one is this morning. I love being a relief preacher, especially for people that I love as much as I love Chris. So will you please pray with me? Lord Jesus, take over here. Amen. As a child growing up in the Baptist church, I remember learning this story, this story of an elderly Isaac who realizes his time is short, and so he intends to give his blessing to Esau, but instead it is Jacob impersonating his older brother. I have a vague recollection of a coloring sheet, 
Maybe you had one of those too. And I remember taking that brown crayon to fill in Jacob's arm and neck with the skins that he wore to try to convince his father that he was his ruddy, outdoorsy older brother. And I see the outline of Papa Isaac reclining in bed, frail in his old age, eyesight clearly failing, but reaching out to touch his son and to offer his blessing. As a follower of Jesus, I'm clearly a fan of the Gospels, but when it comes to epic tales and the hero's journey, you simply cannot top the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, for sheer drama. And the narrative lectionary, this schedule of scriptures that you all are in right now, really highlights that with these long scripture stories told in, in chronological order. And I know next week my friend Andrew Connors will be here with you as you take off your shoes with Moses basking in the glow of that burning bush. It is great stuff. Isn't it great stuff? Wonderful stories of God's faithfulness to God's people? Certainly. Though as you all experienced with my other friend, Joe Clifford, last week with Abraham's near sacrifice of his son Isaac, these ain't bedtime stories. I honestly can't remember what I thought about today's text as a child, dragging that brown crayon back and forth over Jacob's arm. But the grown-up me is pretty appalled by all this deception, this preying on an old man's feebleness, this utter betrayal by Rebecca and her favored son, not only of father and husband, but a betrayal of fairness and justice itself. Isaac even seems to suspect that something is up. The voice sounds like Jacob, but the body feels like Esau, so I guess I'll go with it? Come on! This is wacky. Isaac meant to bless Esau. How is this blessing allowed to hold, mistakenly given as it was? Intent matters, and Isaac intended it for someone else. Just take it back. Don't let him get away with this chicanery. This aggression will not stand. The narrative lectionary skips over what comes next and cuts right to the dream that Jacob has, this ladder and the ascending and descending and even more words of blessing. But as was mentioned by the liturgist, there's, there's something important that happens before that dream. And I invite you to read it yourself in all its fullness, but here it is. Jacob, after got, getting this blessing, he, he has barely left his father's side before Esau comes in, his arms full of the game that he himself has hunted. I want you to imagine him there. I want you to imagine him preparing that food himself. Imagine how long that process takes. This is not HelloFresh with pre-chopped and conveniently wrapped packets. This takes time. Then he brings it to his father, his beloved father, and then they both realize what has transpired. And Esau's cries to his father are heartbreaking. Have you not reserved a blessing for me? Have you only one blessing, father? Bless me, me also, father. Because blessings in this time and culture are not just heartfelt words. They confer tangible benefits, servants, supplies, status, so Esau's denied blessing has real impact on his life. It's no wonder then that Esau is consumed by thoughts of vengeance, such that Jacob must flee at once, carrying his stolen blessing. Now, friends who know me well know that I have been obsessed with the show Ted Lasso. I just love it. It's funny and it's emotionally intelligent, and you all should watch it. And this week's episode in particular whispered to me directly as I was preparing to preach. There's a scene from Friday's show in which two characters are talking to one another, no spoilers, about some awful things that another character did to both of them. 
And one character is so full of resentment. She's been carrying around so much baggage as a result of that betrayal. And she says, I hated him for what he did. And I still hate him. Meanwhile, the second character has been able to forgive the betrayal. And at one point, that second person says, which would you rather be? Would you rather be loving or would you rather be right? Now, I know what I'm supposed to say. I know what the correct answer is. I mean, the conversation they're having in the show is even happening in a church, for heaven's sake, so they're kind of forecasting which one we're meant to choose. But being right feels so good. Are you with me? (laughs) And as we start to maybe, maybe see the end of this pandemic peeking over the horizon, one of the things that we will have to reckon with is that the last 18 months of isolation and fragmentation and apprehension have incentivized being right over being loving and judging over empathy. As a leadership coach who works with a lot of pastors and a lot of congregations, I've noticed that even really healthy churches are starting to see fissures, little cracks in the foundation. People are a little more short with one another. People are a little more dug in in their positions. And that's to say nothing of the less healthy ones, which are really struggling. With so much of our lives lived online and at a remove from one another, it becomes much easier to see one another as if through a funhouse mirror, emphasizing and distorting all of their worst qualities. Perhaps you saw the article a couple of weeks ago that revealed that A few years ago, Facebook changed its algorithm to try to encourage more engagement on its site. That's what it was meant to do. What it actually did is it increased our sense of outrage, our anger, our division. As the saying goes, it's hard to hate up close, but we haven't been up close, and it's taking its toll. We're quick to judge these days, and it's not hard to bring the same judgment to the scripture story. Jacob and his mother, Rebecca, bear the most responsibility for this thing going sideways, but what about Isaac? What about his mishandled blessing? You'd think he would have exercised a little bit more care with something so important. What was he thinking? Well, I suspect he wasn't thinking exactly, and maybe that's the key to all this. You see, there's a little piece of Isaac's story, a little bit of his personal history that happens a chapter before this, but many, many years before. Before Jacob and Esau were even born, it's easy to miss. Like in the previous chapter, it's just one little verse. It's actually even a half a verse. There was a famine in the land. Famine in the land. Isaac had lived through a famine. Famine, of course, isn't just a single off season of harvest. This is an extended period of drought, starvation, desperation. Isaac wants to flee to try to find food, but God tells him to stay put and promises him offspring, promises him a future. His belly is empty, but he feasts on that promise, and maybe that's enough to keep the hunger pangs at bay. Now, I don't know what it's like to live through a famine, but I would imagine if you survive one, that you never, for the rest of your life, take a meal for granted. I bet every meal, no matter how simple, fills you with gratitude, especially a meal of simple game, prepared just for you, which you share together when you know the end is near and your time is short, so if you're going to offer a blessing, you better do it now. Why didn't Isaac wait? 
Why didn't he ask for identification first? Because the beauty of a blessing is that it doesn't verify. It's not cautious and careful. It demands to be given. It's like money burning a hole in your pocket. When you've known famine, starvation, when you've been confronted with your own fragility but are now full again like Isaac, not just full of food but full of love and and joy over the familiar touch of your loved ones, well, the blessing can't wait. The blessing isn't rational. It's not right or wrong. It simply is and it must be shared. A few days ago, I attended my first live music in probably two years. I went with a group of friends and my mother to an outdoor concert, one of those picnic on the lawn type of venues. And one of these friends that I attended with is pregnant, and she's about halfway to term. And this is someone that I work with on a variety of church-related things, so I've seen her on Zoom countless times over the last year and a half. And so it hadn't really occurred to me to miss her. But I hadn't seen her in person. I hadn't seen her in the flesh. We hadn't hugged in all that time. And so that night I was able, with her permission, to touch her baby bump and to ooh and ah over the excitement about the life inside of her. And then the music started. And I had forgotten how beautiful it is to sing at the top of your lungs with thousands of voices together. And I had this outlandish notion that I I would have gladly hugged any one of those strangers, maybe even done the cheek kiss thing if we didn't have masks on, right? It was downright (laughs) Isaac-esque. I got a blessing in me and I just got to let it out. Now, this all may sound a little strange, and I feel a bit sheepish to say this because we are nice, reserved Presbyterians, you know, but we're Presbyterians living in bodies. The center of our faith is the amazing news that God became flesh. God chose to live up close, and when it came time to bestow a blessing on the world, God didn't hesitate to offer up God's own self. And we have lost a lot over these months. We've been famished in a lot of ways. And your takeaway from this pandemic is your own, but for me it is this. With so much loss, so much grief, so much rancor, so much need for healing, we need people who will err on the side of love rather than correctness. I'm still annoyed by this story, though. I mean, my sense of justice is offended by the scoundrel Jacob slinking off with his pilfered blessing. And that's okay, because we know that justice is not the opposite of love, but a necessary dimension of it. I feel better knowing that Esau does okay for himself. And Jacob doesn't exactly have smooth sailing, even though he's got the blessing in his pocket, and you can read about that. But even better is this, when the estranged brothers meet again down the road, Jacob is full of remorse and repentance, and Esau will have none of that. He will have none of all that groveling. He embraces him without hesitation. And then down the road even further, the two brothers come together again to bury their father. And I suspect that they were able to do so, to come together there at the very end, because they had a good example of someone who didn't hold back. I want to bless like Isaac embracing the person in front of me with abandon and without reservation. I want to bless like that old benediction, which says life is short, and we do not have much time to gladden the hearts of those who make the journey with us. So be swift to love 
and make haste to be kind. Thanks be to God. Amen. In response to God's word for us, please join me as we say what we believe using the words displayed on the screen and in today's bulletin from the Declaration of Faith. God chose one people for the sake of all. To the world in its rebellion and alienation, God promised blessing and restoration. The Lord chose Abraham and his descendants as bearers of that promise for all peoples. They had done nothing more than others to deserve the Lord's favor, but God loved them and made them his own. We acknowledge God's freedom and grace, though we are unworthy. The Lord has made us his own in Christ. God has chosen us as his servants for the sake of the world and destined us to be his daughters and sons, giving us love and life, calling us to worship and honor him. Amen. Please be seated. Unless your birthday is in October, in which case I want you down here up front so we can recognize you and sing you happy birthday. I also wanted to say 
that today is Susan Rohde's 75th birthday. And these beautiful flowers were uh, given by her family in celebration of her birthday. But Susan uh, used her birthday prerogative to take the day off, uh, so, which I can understand. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Here's how this is going to work. I will ask you your name, and you'll tell me your name and your birthday, and then I'll repeat it out loud so that everybody can hear, and even the folks at home can hear through my microphone. And we'll start with you, Bonnie. Oh. <laughs> this is Bonnie Durr, and her birthday is October 7th. Rustling, October 2nd. Jim Bear, October 22nd. And this is Jim Bear. His birthday is October 22nd. So, over all these birthday saints, let us pray a blessing for them. You will find our birthday prayer in your bulletin. Oh God, our times are in your hands. Look with favor, we pray, on your servants as they begin another year. Grant that they may grow in wisdom and grace and strengthen their trust in your goodness all the days of their lives. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Happy birthday, y'all. Let us pray. Almighty and loving God, creator of the universe and giver of all good things, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God of blessing, restoration, and freedom, we lift our hearts in thanks and praise for the gift of this beautiful day, for the refreshment of rain this past week, and for cooler temperatures. We thank you, Lord, for your gifts of grace and generosity in our lives. We thank you for enabling us to know the joy and peace of your presence with us, despite and often in the midst of the circumstances of our lives. We pray today for the welfare of your people in the world, for all those who suffer oppression and violence, for all those who live in fear, for those who are hungry, for all who are bereft of family, friends, of a place they can call home, for all who are sick in body, mind, or spirit. We pray especially for all those affected by the situations in Haiti and Afghanistan. Lord, in your mercy, grant your grace of peace, protection, comfort, courage, and healing. Grant that leaders everywhere will be given hearts of flesh to govern with compassion and care for all, and especially for those who live on the fringes of society. We pray for those who continue to be devastated by losses due to COVID. We thank you for the gift of vaccines and pray that more and more people will open to its protection, thereby protecting themselves and those around them. Lord, we ask that you will protect all those who have been unable to access the care they need because of their life circumstances and make ways where there have been so far no ways we ask for your presence, protection, and healing for those of our own church family in need, and especially for Heath, for all who are in need of your healing, grace, and comfort. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We give you thanks for the gift of being able to worship together in person once again. We're grateful for technology 
and for those who give of their expertise that allow us to stay connected virtually. Inspire in our hearts the longing to worship you. Inflame our hearts to continue to grow in relationship with and service to one another and to the world around us in love and glory to you. May we live as you call us to, to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly before you, O Lord our God. All this we ask in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God's covenantal promises continue to bless us with grace and mercy. Let us then, with generous hearts, bring our gifts, which are a portion of what God has given us, that they might be blessed to us and to our world. During this time of COVID, we are not passing the offering plates, but ask that you continue to make your offering through our website or via check in the mail. And as Pastor Alex already said, there is a box in the narthex for those of us who are here who may wish to place your offering there as you exit. Let us pray. Gracious and generous God, we come to you with grateful hearts and give you but a fraction of your own. All that we have, you have given us. We give you thanks and praise, O Lord, for your abundant generosity and gracious faithfulness. Bless these gifts, O Lord, we pray, and use them for the purposes of your kingdom glory. Amen. As we leave this place and prepare to be sent into the world, sent to chase those blessings, sent to share them with one another, we go with gifts that God gives us. I want to share with you words from the Franciscan blessing, which says, may God bless you with discomfort at easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships so that you will live deeply and from the heart. May God bless you with anger at injustice, oppression, and the exploitation of people so that you will work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless you with tears to shed for those who mourn so that you will reach out your hand to them and turn mourning into joy. And may God bless you with just enough foolishness to believe you can make a difference in this world so that you will do what others say cannot be done. And may we all go from this place knowing that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit go with us now and forevermore. Amen.
Shabbat Shalom.